good to see everyone with us here this morning. We are thankful to our Heavenly Father for this time we have to come together. The songs of worship that we have sung to him this morning, we pray that they were found acceptable in his sight. We want you to know that if you're visiting here with us, that you are a welcome guest. We invite you to come back at any opportunity that you might have. Before we step into the lesson today, you may have noticed we have begun a new publication. Instead of the weekly bulletin that we had been running for about 10 years, we switched to a different format that will be on a monthly basis. And you'll see it on, in the same holders. Uh, they'll actually hold up better in those holders because they're forced to bend and they won't dro droop like the other ones did. Anyway, be sure to take one or take two or three. I've been wanting to make some changes for a while, more than just simply an article. And this publication will have sections that you can work. We have a family Bible time section that you can sit down with your family. Even the article itself, the main article will have a series of questions that would relate to it if you want to work and exercise your knowledge of the Word of God. So please feel free to take that. For those who are visiting, information about the congregation is on the back, including the list of elders and deacons and so forth, our preachers that we help support. And uh, this, I didn't do this so you can pick what Sundays to come and which ones not, but I'm going to start doing a preview of coming sermon topics in the next month. So <clears throat> mark your calendars to be here because surely they'll all be interesting. And so kind of take a note of that if you would. We're going to be looking at the last lesson that we have ran through the course of January that is based upon the overall word for the year that I've picked for myself. The word is growth. And what we have been looking at specifically with these lessons have to do with growth in service. Uh, for instance, the first lesson we talked about growth and service to ourself. And that is essentially preparing ourselves so that we might go on in our service unto God. In the second lesson, we talked about growth in our service unto God. Third lesson, which was last week, we talked about our growth and service to the local congregation. And then this morning, we're going to be looking at growth and service to God others growth in our service unto others now this is one of those things that it takes a lot of effort you know, here's what i mean by that we're going to show here in just a moment that it all begins with the subject of love and this is a biblical point but the idea of service unto others has got to go beyond simply words and and principles it is the idea it is a concept here that possesses our lives in such a way that creates action within our life. Um, a little bit later, we're going to talk about that our love for others needs to be more than in just words. It needs to be in, in deeds and in action. And so what we're talking about this morning is a fundamental idea and concept that we have to have as Christians, but yet to truly have it, we must let it be manifested within our lives. And I mentioned that it all begins with love. Jesus in John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35, in talking to his disciples, his apostles here that he had assembled together with the, the night that he was to be betrayed. Notice what he says in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. He says, little, he says a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now, Jesus would have made this statement sometime between 30 and 33 AD. You know, depending on who you listen to as far as when he may have walked on the earth and when he would have died, somewhere in that time frame, the last hours of his, uh, of his life, at least before his death, he tells his apostles that the new command that I give you is to love one another. Now, this was a crucial part of the Christian's life in the first century. And it was going to be crucial for the local congregations themselves to be able to function together and work together. It was going to be necessary for brethren who hear of other brethren's plight over there to be willing to to 
foster, to rally themselves together to be able to help those who were in need. It was going to be crucial, the proper love for one another. And by the time John writes his three letters that we have, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he finds it's necessary to remind the brethren again of the importance of this love. Let's look at three different passages. First, we're going to be, finding, we're going to be looking at in, is 1st John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. Now in 1 John chapter 2, let's start our reading there in verse 7. Follow along in your Bibles as we read down through verse 11. He says, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which we have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Now look at verse 9. He says, he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now John references this old commandment. And I believe in the context there, he is talking about the commandment to love one another. When Jesus issued it, it was a new command. It was something different than what even the, the Jews were used to. But now, 60 years later, roughly, this should be commonplace with every Christian. This proper love towards one another. And so he, and, and I want you to notice the contrast here he makes. Verse 9, he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. And he who loves his brother abides in the light, and there's no cause for stumbling in, in him. The Bible clearly establishes that in our relationship to one another, there could be no room for hatred. There must only be love for one another. Now, it's easy to say, well, you know, I don't hate them. But it's more important to be able to say, I love them. And if we're going to be walking in the light as he is in the light, if we're going to have fellowship with our Heavenly Father, then we are to have this proper love for one another, this proper love for our fellow brethren in Christ. It is the agape love. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul talks about that in verses 4 through 8. It is the love that Christ had for us that brought about his death upon the cross of Calvary. It is this love whereby one is willing to lay down his life for a friend. It's a love that surpasses anything else that we, that man himself could have ever come up with. This is the love we're supposed to have. Turn over now to chapter 3. <clears throat> Note with me in 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 18. John says some more about this. 1 John chapter 3, beginning there in verse, starting in verse 11. <clears throat> he says, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who is of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life. Because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. However, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. John again elaborates on the difference between the way the world would approach things and the way that we are to approach things. The world approaches it from the standpoint it's okay to hate. It's not necessary that you love everybody that it's fine to have people in the world that you just do not love. But when we're talking about brethren, when we're talking about fellow brethren in Christ, there has got to be this love for one another. So much so that there's compassion. And we can talk about that and we'll mention compassion a little bit later. But it's a love that results in a compassion, a compassion that sees a brethren in need and it says, hey, I've got what you need. Let me help you with that. Turn with me now to chapter 4. Chapter 4. First John chapter 4, let's start our reading there in verse 7, and let's read down through verse 12. 
He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Notice that, 1 John 4, verse 7. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He's a beloved if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So we have a standard here, a standard whereby we see how we're supposed to love one another. See, think about this for a moment. Go back to the day that you, through a study of the word of God, you were convicted to obey what you saw within the scriptures. You were convicted to become a Christian. You studied the scriptures, you, you, you read about sin, you were convicted about the dangers of sin, you read about the solution to sin, being Christ's death upon the cross of Calvary, and you saw what Christ did for you, you see it in the scriptures. Finally, your belief level, your conviction, your persuasion reaches a point that you say, what must I do? And so then you're told that you need to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. The same message that Peter gave on the day of Pentecost. So you see all that and you, you feel persuaded that now this is what you must do. And you are baptized into Christ, a baptism that's based upon the belief and the, the repentance. You rise up then to walk in newness of life. You say, now I'm a Christian, now I'm ready to serve God. All that is wonderful. But in the course of the conviction process, there needed to be a conviction that would make you understand that now you're a part of a body of people who make up the body of Christ. And now all of a sudden, you have a responsibility to love them all. Now, you would think it would be natural, but it's not always natural. And I'll tell you why. We are people, and we're not perfect. And I tell you what, I get on some people's nerves. Don't raise your hand if I do. That's really not the time. But I know I get on people's nerves. And I know there's been people in my life who have found at times a bit difficult to say, I love him. Okay? Uh, my mom never had a problem with that. But I think everybody else may have. You know? And, I, I, you know, we, we realize that we have to deal with one another. And Paul talks about so much about the way that we're supposed to deal with one another. And what he does in his teachings to the Holy Spirit is he tells us how to take this love that we're supposed to have one another. And that love becomes a bond which binds us all together in this perfection, if you would. And this enables us to live and be towards one another in a such a way that we can honestly say we don't hate one another, but we love one another. And, and it therefore then affects the way that we are towards each other. It affects the way that we live. It affects the way that we treat one another. It affects the very level of who we are. All because we were convicted enough by the fact of God loving us so much that he sent his only begotten son. And so therefore we love others of like precious faith. That's just what we see within the scriptures. We are a family. God is our father by the spirit of adoption and Christ is our brother. We, we understand that. And so we see this love that we are supposed to have. So it all begins with love. Now, before we move on, we've got to throw one thing out there that now says you've got to be kidding me. And that is from Matthew chapter 5. We're even supposed to love our enemies. Now, if you're all as nice as I am, you know you don't have any enemies. I don't know. Maybe I do, and I don't know about it. Um, I've got in-laws. I don't know if that counts. One time. Anyway, so it's very possible you don't have any enemies. Maybe there's nobody that hates you. Maybe no one has ever done you harm. Maybe no one has ever acted out of spite towards you. But let's say they do. What are you tempted with at that moment? Well, the temptation there should really be to abide by what the scriptures teach. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. We have a responsibility to love those who do not love us. And really, that is, that is really the ultimate goal. Christ is going to make the point here, and we'll read it shortly, that if you love people who love you, what benefit does, does it do for you? The idea is to love those who don't love you. That's where the strength of the challenge 
Well, this is where we see it really being brought to task. Let's start there in verse 43 of Matthew chapter 5. He says, you've heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was an understood rule of thumb. You know, the Israelites had enemies all the days that they were existent as a people. Even in the 100, 200 years leading up to the time of Christ, they had enemies. Enemies who wanted them to be put down. And so the general rule of thumb is you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Christ says, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now that's an easy verse to memorize. And that's an easy verse to say that we believe in. But it's the application of that verse in the hardest times of our life that really becomes the struggle. And that's really what we're looking at as Christians. It's not, so bad, it's not so much about being faithful to God when it's easy to be faithful. It's about being faithful when it is a challenge to be faithful. It is to love our enemies when we know they are right in front of us and they despise us. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Talking about growth. Good job, you love those who love you. You know what, everybody does that. Let's do something better than that. You're willing to help those who help you. That's great. But let's do better than that. Let's rise above what the world does and let our lives be driven by the love that we see taught within the scriptures. See, this love, if it exists within our lives, is going to be manifested or seen in our actions. I mean, it's easy to say, I love you, and, 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 and to not mean it, unless you're an honest person, then I don't know how you could do that. But it's easy to say, I love you. The test comes down to whether or not the love is genuine. And if it is, then it's going to be manifested by our deeds. Remember what we read a while ago in um, John chapter 3, verse 18. You know, and that's not right. Turn to 1 John 3, verse 18. I'm missing a, a wand there in front of that. 1 John chapter 3, note with me there in verse 18. We read this passage earlier. He says, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue. He says, but in deed and in truth. That's where the test comes in. Having the proper love for one another in deed and in truth. This is what we are to strive for as the children of God. This is how the bond of perfection is going to be fundamentally manifested in Colossians chapter 3, there in verse 14, we see the Apostle Paul making very specific reference to this perfect bond uh, or this bond of perfection. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14, but above all these things, he says, put on love. Why? Because love is that bond. And what happens is this love affects how we treat one another. This love is going to affect the way that we behave towards one another. One of my favorite Bible passages, and I've shared this with you before, I'm sure, is Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. And I only say favorite in that it essentially says, okay, it's much more than principle. It is an application that our lives as Christians really are manifested towards one another. For instance, Start there in verse 9. We've been talking about love. Verse 9 of Romans chapter 12 says, Let love be without hypocrisy. The love that we have for one another needs to be sincere, needs to be genuine. If you don't love somebody, don't tell them you love them. It's that simple. Okay, and I'm not talking about boyfriend, girlfriend love and stuff like that, puppy love and so forth. We're talking about your love for others as Christians. And if, and if someone you can't stand comes up to you and says, I love you, and they're your brother or sister in Christ, and you feel obligated to say, well, I love you too, and you don't, you might keep your mouth shut and go, well, thank you, I appreciate that. I wish I could say the same, but I got to work on it. You know, maybe too much honesty there. 
But you get the point, though. It's so easy to reply back. It's like when sometimes people say, would you pray for me? It's so easy. I sure will. Do we? You know, maybe group it under a little bit of justification. Well, I'll pray at night for everybody. And that's just a big old basket that'll catch everybody, including this prayer request. We need to be sincere. We need to be genuine. <clears throat> so anyway, he continues. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. And honor giving preference to one another. Then he says, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. He says, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Then he says, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Then he says, bless those who persecute you. Let's get into a little bit more challenging area. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who Weep. You see the genuineness that needs to be possessed by the individual who is going to love someone else to the point that you rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. You be of the same mind towards one another. You don't set your mind on high things, but you associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Then he says, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peacefully with all men. Boy, how much love is going to help with that. It's, it's just amazing to, to recognize. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. Then he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's what love enables us to do. It enables us to overcome that which is evil, to behave towards our fellow brethren, and not just our fellow brethren, but people in general, to behave towards them in the manner and the way that we are supposed to. Consider another demonstration here within the action. Notice with me, if you would, for just a moment, there in Colossians chapter 3. We see several things listed there in Colossians 3, verses 12 through 14. And Ephesians 4 is kind of a parallel passage to that. Oftentimes we read through these passages in and, and, and our dutiful Bible reading, which is good. We're supposed to be reading our Bibles and studying our Bibles. But do we stop and ask ourselves for a moment, do what we read, or does, does that exist, I should say, within our lives? For instance, Colossians 3, beginning in verse 12. He says, Therefore is the elect of God, holy and beloved, Put on tender mercies. I think the English Standard Version says compassion. All right, we're supposed to possess tender mercy or compassion towards one another. And then it says kindness. And then we have humility. And then he throws in there meekness. And notice this. Not only does he say meekness, but he says long-suffering. So in our behavior towards others. There is this call to be kind. There is this call to be long-suffering. There is this call to bear with one another. There is even this call to forgive one another. All of this is possible by the love that we have been taught when Christ came and gave his life for us. Forgiving one another, if anyone has to complain against another, even so Christ forgave you, so, so, so you also must do. But above all these things, he says, put on love, the bond of perfection. Those are the, that's the application of it. This is the so what. Okay, I'm supposed to love other Christians, so how does that affect my life? Well, there we have it. Here we have the list of how it is supposed to affect our lives. Now, real quickly, let's consider another area where love is seen within action. What about benevolence? There's a lot of Bible passages we could call up at this point. But I want to recall what we read while ago in 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. He makes the point there that if anyone has what his brother's in need of and does not give it to him, that there's the problem. The love that we're supposed to have for one another says, you know, my brother is in need. Okay, And I like the fact that he, he talks about that need there. My brother is in need and I've got what he has need of. And he's not really talking about taking away from myself so that I don't have any more. But it's the idea of I have the abundance and my brother's in need. I'm willing to share. I'm willing to split it with him. I'm willing to give, what, give him what he needs. 
You know, is to be willing to make the sacrifice on my part so my brother has what he is in need of. It is this compassion brought about by the love that causes us to see the need and be willing to say, here, let me help. We can talk about other areas, but talk about specifically spiritual areas now. You know, there is a spiritual concern that exists among brethren. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, it is the idea of edification, the idea of making someone strong, helping to build someone up. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, he says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify, okay? There are certain things that in and of themselves may not be harmful, but yet, and may not be wrong, but yet they don't edify, they don't build up. And as Christians, our goal is to make one another stronger. Ephesians chapter, or 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26, he says, let everything be done for the purpose of edification. It's one of the reasons why we worship together. But we also find that there needs to be a concern that goes to a brother caught in sin and say, brother or sister, we need to come back to the scriptures. Galatians chapter, notice with me, Galatians chapter 6. I've got five on the screen. I don't know why I put five on the screen. But turn with me to Galatians chapter 6, the first five verses there. He says, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And then he says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, think about this, responsibility to help each other as we struggle through this life and striving to live a life that is faithful unto our Heavenly Father. If I am in sin, you are my brother by telling me. You love me, you come tell me. If you're in sin and I know this, then I need to come talk to you about it. In, in brotherly love, in humility of spirit, he's talking about. James 5, 19 through 21. It helps to bring a brother back to Christ, the saving of his soul, the forgiveness of his sins that had separated him from God when we restore one back to Christ. And I guess there are many other things that we could talk about when it comes to our growth and service unto others. And really, we'd probably make it a two or three part lesson. And then some of it we've already talked about in previous lessons, like the one last week. But let me leave you with this. In Romans chapter 12, verse 5, the Apostle Paul makes the point that we are members of one another. We have a connection that we don't have with people of the world. And that is, you're in fellowship with God. I'm in fellowship with God. Therefore, we're in fellowship with one another. And if an individual is not in fellowship with God, they're not a part of that body. We're part of the same spiritual family. And so we need to work as we go through this year to doing what we can. And this is where, this is where self-evaluation comes in. It's not looking at others. It's looking at myself with a piece of paper and saying, what can I do better? You know, who should I call? Who should I call more often? Who should I check on? What can I do to help? Find the list and ask, what can I do that would be able to manifest my love for my fellow brethren? If you're not a Christian, you need to become one. You need to make the decision to obey the gospel's call and salvation. Christ loved you and he came and died upon the cross. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that you could be saved. The question is, will you take the opportunity made possible by the shedding of Christ's blood upon the cross? If you believe that Christ is the son of God, then let's make the decision this morning to turn away from sin. Obey his command to be baptized, so you rise up then to walk in newness of life. Now you've put to death that old man of sin. Let's put on the new man, this new creature, and live your life faithful unto Christ. Be faithful even unto death, and you will receive eternity with God in heaven. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully. Why not? Do you need the prayers of the congregation? Is it something that we can help you with, study with you? Then ask us. We'll be happy to... Help with the burden, if you would. But you need to recognize the need to come back. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward now as we stand and as we sing.